most people hate statistics and they would rather have nothing to do with it. But wishes are not horses. Many healthcare practitioners need to know statistics either for research or to understand scientific publications. I am Oluwadiya Kende. Over the course of three lectures, I will be taking you on a journey through statistics. This is the second of three videos on the effective use of advanced statistical methods in medical research. In the first part, I tried to convince you that it is in your best interest to get to grip with statistics by showing you that many research papers are full of errors, and you need to be able to spot errors in published studies. In addition, I also showed you the three most important functions of statistics. Finally, I showed you why you may need to transform the variables in your data. I then demonstrated how to do logarithmic transformations in SPSS. In this, the second lecture in the series, we will look at the limitations of the p-value and introduce you to the confidence interval that is the alternative to the p-value. We will then look at some statistical methods for comparing two or more groups when the data is continuous. We will end the lecture by digging into regression and correlation. Many of us are familiar with the p-value. It is the time-honored statistics for testing the null hypothesis. However, with time, we have come to realize that the p-value has some shortcomings. For example, we know definitely that the p-value is not as informative as the confidence interval. P-value tells a story, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Yes, the p-value shows there is a difference in the statistics between the two between any two groups, but it doesn't tell us the magnitude of the difference. Simply put, the p-value is nothing but an estimation of probability. And since it does not measure the effect size, you cannot rely solely on p-values for making clinical decisions. For example, a very large study might find that a difference of 0.5 mm of mercury in the blood pressure between two treatment groups is statistically significant. But ask yourself, is this clinically relevant? As someone said in the past, a large study dooms you to statistical significance. I want to emphasize again that p-values does not indicate clinical significance. Supposing you find that the mean height of 5-year-old and 4-year-old children in a group of children was 172 cm and 171.5 cm respectively. You run a t-test to determine if the two values are significantly different from each other. The p-value of the significant test was 0.02, which means that 5-year-old kids are significantly more likely to be taller than 4-year-old kids by 0.5 cm. So what? How important is this in practical terms? Ask yourself. Can you even measure this difference routinely in the clinic with the weighing scales that are available to you? So, while your analysis is statistically significant, it is of no practical value. On this slide, I will be listing some factors that may help you to determine the clinical importance of p-values that are significant. First one that we are going to consider is this. Is the study design appropriate for the objectives of the study? Then ask yourself. It is also important to take into consideration the adverse effects of the treatment under consideration. For example, drugs have been withdrawn in the past, not because they were not effective, but because they had unacceptable adverse effects. Talidomide, which was a drug that was used in pregnant women in the 60s was a horrific example of this. As shown in the previous slide, you must be able to practically measure the differences that have been found to be statistically significant. Other things to be taken into consideration include the duration of effect. For example, an analgesic that must be taken hourly is not likely to be approved 
because patients will not comply with the treatment. The cost of the new intervention must also be taken into consideration. A drug that is too expensive is not likely to be acceptable to the vast majority of the population. Finally, ask yourself, can the result be generalized to the population? Before you can do this, you must consider the sample size, the sample methodology, and the statistical methods used in the study. There are many measures of effect size and clinical significance, and I'm going to be listing some of these measures here. These measures are important because after you might have reported your clinical significance, it is very important that you also report these measures of effect size, which can help clinicians and other users in making decisions regarding what you have found in your study. Coens D is an appropriate effect size for the comparison be- between the two means. It can be used, for example, to accompany the reporting of t test and ANOVA results. Odds ratio and relative risk compares one proportion to another. Relative risk reduction is a convenient way of presenting risk ratios as percentages, whereas absolute risk reduction is the number of percentage point difference between the risks for two health interventions. The number needed to treat is the number of patients you need to treat to prevent one additional bad outcome like death, complications, etc. Its counterpart is the number needed to harm, which is the number of people you need to expose to a hazard to develop one additional adverse outcome. On this slide, we can see an example of how absolute risk reduction and number needed to treat are calculated. The relationship between the two measures is also clear from the equation. For example, the number needed to treat when the absolute risk reduction is 0.2 is 5. Number needed to treat is the reciprocal of absolute risk reduction. In the next section, we shall be looking at some of the more common statistical methods for comparing two groups of data. These are some of the most common inferential statistics used in healthcare research. Here on this slide, we have highlighted two of the assumptions of parametric and non-parametric tests. Almost all statistical methods can be divided into these two groups. Parametric tests are employed in the analysis of continuous data, which at the same time must be normally distributed. If your continuous data is not normally distributed, then you can transform them as we showed in the last lecture. Non-parametric tests are robust enough to be used for categorical data and continuous data that are not normally distributed, but usually, they are not nearly as sensitive as parametric techniques. In addition, they are not as easy to un- interpret as parametric techniques. The first of the statistical tests to determine differences in group means that we will be exploring is the t-test. It is also called the student's t-test after the name of its discoverer. The t-test is a parametric bivariate statistic for comparing the means of a continuous variable with two categories. How many variables are required for a t-test? Since t-test is a bivariate statistics, two variables are needed. The first variable is an independent variable. This independent variable must have only two categories. Examples of variables with only two categories include gender. Survivor is another one. Survivor can be categorized into dead or alive. An independent variable is also called a predictor variable, and it is the variable which is manipulated directly by the researcher. Its variations are not affected by other variables in the equation. In fact, that is why it is referred to as the independent variable. In the example on this slide, gender is the independent variable because its variations are not affected by PCV. Rather, it is manipulated directly by the researcher. The researcher can manipulate gender by adding or removing 
either of the two sexes based on the research methodology. For example, a researcher might want to increase the number of females compared to the number of males in his sample, and therefore to do that, all he needs is to recruit more females from the population. The opposite of independent variable is the dependent variable. It, it is so called because its variations are dependent on the independent variable. The dependent variable is also known as the outcome or predicted variable. On this slide, PCV, the second variable, is the dependent variable. It is a continuous variable which also is normally distributed. How will you do t-test in SPSS? This slide shows, how, uh, shows us how to do that. Please note that SPSS refers to t-test as the independent samples t-test. For you to do t-test in SPSS, you click on analyze in the menu bar and then you select compare means. After that, you click on independent samples t-test. One other assumption of the t-test is that the measurement of dependent variables are independent of each other. In other words, once you have measured the dependent variable in one subject, you should not take another measurement in the same subject again. In the example shown in the previous slide, once you have taken the PCV of a particular patient, you shouldn't go back to that patient and measure his or her PCV again. But what happens if you need to compare the group means in an experiment where you need to collect samples on two or more occasions in the same patient? This is what obtains in before and after studies in which you measure the dependent variable, for example, blood pressure, before and after the independent variable, which, for example, can be either of two anti-hypertensive drugs that the researcher is comparing has been given. The researcher may wish to compare the mean blood pressure before and after the patient has taken the drugs. The paired t-test rather than the independent samples t-test must be used for this kind of analysis. The paired t-test is a variance of the student's t Test. Unlike independent t-test, the two variables in paired t-test are continuous. The research design most commonly can be either of two types. Two samples can be taken before and after an intervention in a cohort of study participants. You simply compare the mean of the samples taken before the intervention to the mean of the samples taken after the intervention. This type of design is used when you want to determine if a new intervention is effective. But what if you want to determine if a new intervention is not only effective but better than an established effective intervention, usually called a gold standard? For this, you might use a case control design in which you can compare the pre- and post-test measurements in a group of patients giving the new drug to that of a group giving the established drug. The group giving the new drug is the case and the group on the old drug is the control. If the new drug is more effective than the old drug in reducing the BP, the differences between the mean pre- and post-intervention BP will be greater with the new drug. You will use the paired samples t-test to see if these differences are significantly different from each other for each group. If the mean pre-test BP is significantly higher than the post-test BP in the case group, and as we have seen, this reduction is higher than for the control group, then the researcher can confidently conclude that the new drug is more effective in controlling hypertension than the old drug. So how do you do the peer samples t-test in SPSS? This slide shows us how to do that. To do it, you simply click on analyze and then from the analyze, you again click on compared means. After that, you select peer samples t-test from this sub-menu that unfolds. We have shown that the t-tests are limited to instances when the independent variable has only two categories. But what if you have a situation 
where the independent variable has more than two categories, that is when you should use ANOVA. ANOVA means analysis of variance. What are the requirements of ANOVA? Like the t-test, the ANOVA demands a dependent variable that is not only continuous but also normally distributed. However, unlike the t-test, the independent variable in ANOVA can have more than two categories. In the following example, we have measured the PCV of 50 patients who sustained different kinds of bone fractures. We want to determine if the mean PCV of patients with different number of bones fractured will be significantly different from each other. The independent variable is the number of bones fractured and it has four categories as shown. The four categories are from 0 to 3 and those numbers de designate the number of bones that were fractured. PCV is the dependent variable. It is a continuous variable and as we saw in the first lecture, it is also normally distributed. So, ANOVA can be used for analyzing its group means. On this slide, I will show you how to do ANOVA in SPSS. Like we did in t-test, just click analyze, then go to compared means. After that, you click on one way ANOVA. SPSS produces the result of ANOVA analysis in the output window. The result is reproduced in the slide on display. The first table shows the mean and the standard deviations of the four categories of number of bones fractured. We can see that the DME PCV decreases with increasing number of bones fractured. For example, the mean PCV of patients with no bone fracture is 39.83, which decreased to 24.20 in those patients with three bones fractured. In addition, the overall mean PCV is shown in the total row of the table. The research question is to determine if the differences in the mean PCV are shown are significantly different from each other or whether they are due to chance. This question is answered on the table labeled ANOVA. The significant column, which is labeled SIG, contains the p-value. And as we can see, this is 0.007. So, we will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the mean PCV of patients is significantly different for different categories of patients with different bones fractured. We have determined that the mean PCV of the four categories of bone fractured are different from each other. But the question is, which of the categories is different? For example, is the mean PCV of patients with one bone fractured different from that of those with two bones fractured? What about those with three bones fractured? Is their mean PCV significantly different from those with two bones fractured? This will be illustrated by a dialogue between Einstein and our beloved Ebora Wu, who has just completed an ANOVA analysis. Like the professor he is, Einstein points out the obvious. He asks Ebora, Shegun, there are four means. Of course, the student is happy that he has obtained a result that appears significant. But trust our esteemed professor. He deflated the student's ecstasy by showing him a not-so-obvious poser. Not so fast. Is the significance among all, that, all the means or just some of them? And as expected, the student is crestfallen. He answered, don't know. God bless our professors. He showed the student a way out of the conundrum. He asked the student to do a postdoc test. You should do a postdoc test. But our student does not know what a postdoc is. So he said, post what? The professor explains that a postdoc test tells you which of the means in a variable with more than two categories is really different from each other. And the student wants the professor to earn his salaries. So he asks the professor to demonstrate how 
to do a postdoc test. The professor starts by defining postdoc test. He also emphasized that it is aimed at reducing type 1 errors when you have many pairs of means to compare. The professor emphasized that the postdoc test should only be carried out after a significant ANOVA result. This stands to reason because there is no point in trying to find out if there are a significant difference between individual categories when the main ANOVA is not significant. The postdoc is like doing a series of little t-tests. In our example, it's like doing t-tests be between 0 and 2 bone fractured, between 0 and 3 bones fractured, between 1 and 2 bones fractured, between 1 and 3 bones fractured, and between 2 and 3 bones fractured. If you count all those groups, it is equivalent to doing 6 individual t-tests. Of course, we can do it this way, but there are problems with the method. The first of the problem is that doing a series of t-tests is relatively more cumbersome than doing a postdoc. More importantly, doing a series of t-tests will multiply type 1 errors. Each t-test has a type 1 error determined by the chosen threshold of significance for p-value. This is usually 0.05. In our example, if we carry out 60 tests, the probability of getting a type 1 error in at least one of the T tests will be increased as shown later in the lecture. This slide shows that the probability of obtaining a type 1 error when we do two T tests is 9.75%, and this is almost 1 in 10 chances. On this slide, we show the probability of obtaining a type 1 error if you do 6 little t tests. The formula is as shown and n is the number of t tests. The probability is 0.265 which is 26.5%. That is more than 1 in every 4 instances. It means that in our example with 6 tests, we are almost certainly to obtain a type 1 error. That is a result that will be significant even though in reality it is not. Doing a postdoc test will avoid these errors because the analysis automatically corrects for the errors. To do a postdoc test, you open the ANOVA dialog box. You click on Analyze in menu bar, then you select compared means and you click on one way ANOVA in the sub menu that unfolds. In the ANOVA dialog box, click on the button label post hoc to bring up the dialog box for post hoc tests. There are many types of post hoc tests. Tuki or Bonforoni are among the most popular. Instead here, we have close to about 15 different post hoc tests, but Tuki and Tamis too are among the most popular. Here is the result of the post hoc test. The result is displayed on a table. We use post hoc test and this is displayed in the first column of the table and that is Tuki HSD. In the second column labeled I, number of bones fracture. Each category of the variable is listed and compared to the other categories as shown in the third column. J number of bones fractured. So for example, those with no bones fractured are compared to those with one bone fractured, two bone fractured, and three bone fractured. The fourth column labeled mean difference i minus j contains the product of subtraction of the mean of items in the j column from the high column. That, that is, you subtract the item listed under the j column from the item listed under the high column. And the, the result of that subtraction 
is listed under mean differences i minus j. For example, when you subtract the mean difference of patients with one bone fractured from the mean difference of patients with zero bones fractured, what you obtain is 7.67. If you now go on to the SIG column, which as we learned before means significance, under that is listed the p-value of the difference that has been listed here. So, the p-value of the difference between J number, I mean, between um, patients with one bone fractured and zero bone fractured is 0 0.20210, which, as we know, is not significant. But when you will look at the second row, the significant value is 0 0.020. Now let's go back to column 4. And let's look at that same second row. We will see that the item listed here has a mark, an asterisk after it. So, SPSS has made things simple for us. If you look at the items listed under mean difference, high minus J, any of the item that is marked with an asterisk is significant. If you take, for example, 15.63 and you go and look at the equivalent p-value, it is 0 0.012. So we can confidently say that patients with two bones fractured have PC, mean PCV that is significantly different from patients with zero bone fractured. This, in the same way, we can also say that patients with three bones fracture also have mean PCV that is significantly different from those patients with zero bones fracture. But if you go to the I, to the row of patients with one bone fracture, you can see that patients with one bone fracture has no significant significant results. In other words, the bones with the patients with one bone fracture are not likely to have P mean PCV that are significantly different from any of the other groups of patients. So scanning through the table, we can confidently say that those with two bones fractured will be um, likely to have mean PCV that are significantly lower than those with zero. Same also applies to those with three bones fractured. The table labeled post hoc tests homogeneous subset is important for summarizing the previous table. It groups the categories of the independent variables into groups, which are homogeneous. There are two homogeneous subsets in the analysis, subset 1, which includes patients with 3, 2, and 1 bones fractured, and then subset 2, which includes patients with just 1 and no bones fractured. What this means is that, for example, that means subset 2, which is between 1 and 2, I mean 1 and 0. It means that patients with one bone fractured and patients with two bones fractured are not likely to have mean PCV that are different from each other. On the other hand, subset 1 contains groups 1, 2, and 3, which means that patients with one bone fracture two bones fracture and three bones fracture are not likely to have mean PCV that are significantly different from each other. Next, we move on to correlation, which is a test of association between two continuous variables. The analysis produces a correlation coefficient, rho, which has values between zero and one. Values close to zero are deemed weak and those close to one are deemed strong. Correlations can be positive when both variables grow together. For example, the relationship between age and weight of children. On the other hand, negative correlations occur when the growth of the two variables are in opposite direction. An example is the length of candle versus how long it stays lit. 
On this slide, we will show how to do correlations in SPSS. Click on Analyze, then Correlate and Bivariate. This should bring up the Correlate dialog box. After populating the box, click on OK to bring up the result in the output window. In the correlation table, the correlation coefficient is 0.808, which means our result here has a high correlation. Regressions are a group of advanced statistic technique that is based on fitting a line, usually called the regression line to the data. The fitted line is based on the reg regression equation as shown on the slide. There are different types of regression. The most common used types include linear regression, which uses continuous data to predict continuous outcome, while logistic regression uses continuous and categorical data to predict probability of a dichotomous outcome. The linear regression equation is displayed on the slide. The dependent variable is gamma. The predictor variable is B1. Beta 0 is the intercept of the regression line. This is the regression line. This is beta 0 and it is the intercept, the position where the slow the line crosses the y axis. The slope is represents B1, beta 1, and in this instance, the slope is positive, and it means that both the dependent and independent variables are actually increasing together. On the other hand, you can have a negative regression slope as shown on this slide. In a negative regression slope, the outcome variables goes up when the predictor variables goes down and vice versa. This is a negative regression slope. Finally, we have the third kind of regression slope that is flat. This is the kind of slope you see when there is no relationship between the independent and dependent variables. In the next group of slides, we shall be looking at some important regression terms. The first one we will be considering is residual. Regression involves building models to represent the data. Regression line is actually the line that best fits the data. As shown on the slide, each point represents an observation. There are distances between most observations and the line. These distances are the residual. And it can be positive when the data point is above the line and negative when the data point is below the line. Residuals are very important for the fit of the model. When the residuals are small, then the model will fit the data better and the predictive ability of the model will be higher. On the other hand, large residuals make for poor model fit. The goodness of fit is the second important term we will be looking into. The goodness of fit shows how well the model fits the data. Two methods are provided by SPSS to determine the goodness of fit. ANOVA is very important because it determines if the model is useful. If ANOVA is significant, the model is statistically significant and you can use the model. On the other hand, if ANOVA is not statistically significant, then you should jettison the model. The coefficient of determination R squared is the percentage of the variant in the outcome that is accounted for by the model. It is a measure of effect size. When a model does not fit well, this is usually due to two factors, outliers and influential cases. Outliers are observations that are far away from the regression line. 
they are taking to be observations with standardized residuals greater than 3. Outliers can adversely affect the model fit. Researchers should consider outliers as having serious effect if they observe any of the following. If any single case has a standardized residual greater than 3. 2. If more than 1% of the cases have standardized residuals greater than 2.58. Then 3. If more than 5% of cases have standardized residuals greater than 1.96. SPSS will list your residuals for you. We already know that outliers can mess up the regression analysis. Despite this, as much as you'd like to, you can't just drop outliers. You should consider how they came about before deciding or what to do with them. If you think they are due to errors during the data entry or coding, then you should correct the error or drop the outlier if the error cannot be corrected. But what if they are highly unusual cases? For example, an IQ of 60 in an IQ data set. You exclude them? What if they might reflect important variations? Do you include them? There is no universally accepted way of dealing with the last two scenarios. You should be guided by the following principles. If the outlier affects the assumption, for example, if it has a standardized residual greater than 3 but is not influential, then you should retain the outlier, but you should mention this in your result. We will be describing how you can detect influential cases later in this lecture. If the outlier affects the result and is an influential case, then drop the outlier from the analysis. As an alternative, you might try transforming the data or try nonlinear regression models, which are usually more robust than linear regression. Whatever decision you make, this must be reported in your method stroke result section. In a broad sense, outliers, when they are not due to errors, must be investigated further. If they are truly unique, then they can be reported as case reports. This slide demonstrates how an influential outlier can pull the regression line towards itself and change the slope of the regression line. Here is an extreme outlier. Observe what happens when I remove the outlier. With the outlier removed, the regression line has dropped down. This slide demonstrates an influential outlier and the adverse effect it can have on the regression model. In the next slide, we will look at how to detect influential cases. Influential cases are cases which affect the regression line when they are removed from the analysis. In other words, they can change the model. There are many ways of detecting influential cases. I commonly use Cook's distance, which is significant when it is greater than 1. SPSS will give you Cook's distance when you pick it in the dialog box. Multicollinearity is one of the most common issues that can badly influence the regression model. It occurs when independent variables in the regression model are correlated with each other. Correlation between independent variables is bad because both may be predicting the same thing in the model. You don't want this because the underlying paradigm in the interpretation of the regression coefficient is that it is the change in the dependent variable for every unit change in the independent variable while adjusting for all the other variables in the model meaning that the other variables are held constant. When there is multicollinearity, it is impossible to change one variable without changing the other. Therefore, you cannot isolate the influence of an independent variable 
on the model from the influence of the other independent variable with which it is correlated. They are no longer independent. Multicollinearity is evaluated by doing collinear diagnostics. These diagnostics include running correlation matrix between independent variables, tolerance and variance inflation factor. The next regression term which we'll be looking at is homoscedasticity. Scedasticity means having the same scatter. Homoscedasticity is an assumption of regression. Of course, the opposite of homoscedasticity is heteroscedasticity, which means different scatter. Heteroscedasticity is a problem in regression because it tends to produce p-values that are smaller than they should be. This slide shows the output of the procedure for checking homoscedasticity in SPSS. The scatter of the graph is clustered around zero and the plot has no discernible pattern to it. And therefore, you can confidently say that the data shown here demonstrates homoscedasticity. So how do you do multiple regression in SPSS? To do it, click on Analyze, then click on Regression, and then after that, click on Linear. When you click on Linear, then the Regression dialog box comes up. From the Linear Regression dialog box, click on Statistics, where you will specify the choice of statistics you want to run. In this example, we have clicked on Estimates Confidence Interval under Regression Coefficients. We have clicked on Model Fit, Descriptives, Path and Partial Correlations, and Collinearity Diagnostics. Collinearity Diagnostics, for example, is what will show you whether there are problems with multi-collinearity. And we have also clicked on Case-Wise Diagnostics. Case-Wise Diagnostics is what we, we list the number of cases that have residuals greater than what you specify in this box. When you click on Save button, it brings out the linear regression save dialog box. Click on Cook's distance. Remember that Cook's distance is used for checking whether you have influential cases. This will calculate Cook's distance. And if the Cook's distance is greater than one, that means any outlier that you have shown here is a influential and probably you should not use those outliers. You should exclude those outliers from your analysis. So that is how you combine case-wise case diagnostics that will show you outliers and Cook's distance. So Cook's distance tells you whether the outliers you find there are influential. The regression output has many tables. We have called out just three of them to display on this slide. The model, the model summary table contains the R-squared statistics, which as we learned earlier, is an effect size and the measure of the goodness of fit of the model. Here, the R-square is 0.734, which means that 73.4% of the variance in the dependent variable is accounted for by the model. This is an awesome performance. Not many regression analysis we, we perform this well. Next, we move on to the ANOVA table, which shows that the p-value of the model is 0 0.000, which means that the model is good. Remember that ANOVA is the second of the goodness of fit statistics, and if this p-value has been higher than 0.05, then you will immediately get seen the whole model because it means that it does not fit the model. Let me repeat that. ANOVA is very important. In fact, it is the most important table you have in your output. If ANOVA is not significant, then your model is nothing and it should be jettisoned. The coefficient table contains beta 0 and beta 1 of the regression statistics. These are the values you will need to build your model. Here is beta 0 and then here is the beta 1 for each of the variables in your model. 
Now, to decide which of these variables to put in your regression equation, you need to go to the SIG column. Any of the p-values that are significant here means that the equivalent, uh, the variable that is making that p-value should be included in the regression equation. In this instance, it means that hospital stay with a p-value of 0 0.000 and number of bones fractured with a p-value of 0 0.011 should be included in our final model. Linear regressions are used when the dependent variable is continuous. But what if, as it commonly obtained in the real world, the outcome is dichotomous? Survivor, for example, can be dichotomized into dead or alive. Admission status of patients can be dichotomized into admitted versus discharged. Those are situations where you should use logistic regression. In other lectures in the series, we shall be looking at we shall be looking more closely at uh, logistic regression. But in this series, we have come to the end. Of the second part. In this lecture, we have covered p value and its limitations, statistical methods for comparing two or more groups with continuous data, and finally, we covered correlation and some regression models. In the next lecture, which will be the last in the series, we'll be diving deeper into risk ratios and odds ratio, survivor analysis sensitivity, specificity, and receiver operative characteristic curves. We will end the series by, by setting out guide, guidelines for choosing the right test for specific data analysis. I am Uluwadi Akende. I am a professor of orthopedic and traumatology at the Ekiti State University, Adwekiti, in Ekiti State, Nigeria. I have been teaching statistics in healthcare research since 2004 in Nigeria and South Africa. I am also the author of the best-selling book on SPSS in Nigeria, which is Getting to Know SPSS. That book also has supplementary chapters on online literature such as well as Zotero and EndNote Reference Manager software. Finally, I am the CEO of POSC Educational Consult, which specializes in training in statistical software and health education. My website is at www.oluwadea.com. Thank you.